Unlike walking to a destination, running somewhere, or marching, taking a leisurely stroll is a luxury. Ceremonious inactivity means we do something, but to no end. This to no end, this freedom from purpose and usefulness, is the essential core of inactivity. It is the basic formula for happiness. Hey everybody, thank you so much for watching Leaf by Leaf. Today I'm excited to talk about a philosophy book for the first time, I think, since my video on philosophy that unexpectedly blew up and is still up there and I feel giving a totally false <laughs> representation of who I am and what this channel is. It's a little funny that that video about philosophy and where to start took off and still remains one of my most viewed videos, which keeps it in people's faces because of the algorithm and so on. Yet all of my videos are pretty much about literary fiction predominantly. I very much intended that to be reading Western philosophy as a reader, not as a philosopher. Nonetheless, here I am, you know, what, almost five years later, and I think for the first time this video is going to be on philosophy. And this is mostly because this philosopher totally seized my attention. And I'm talking about Korean-born German philosopher Byung-Chul Han. And we're specifically talking about this little book called The Burnout Society and then Vita Contemplativa. This one is from Stanford University Press. This one is from Polity Books. A lot of Byung-Chul Han's books are put out by Polity, and they're beautiful, by the way. This one was brought to my attention by a friend on Instagram, Australian artist and psychiatrist, Kieran Forster, and he submitted the Burnout Society as his vote for this year's subscriber wildcard pick. It didn't get picked, in case you don't know, Sutri by Cormac McCarthy got picked. But he put that there and then he also messaged me directly on Instagram singing the praises of Jung Chul Han and specifically the Burnout Society. And so at a mere 50 pages, I thought, let me check this out because he was pretty enthusiastic about it. And some of the little things he said really connected with me and things that I've been experiencing and observing and thinking and feeling. And I read this book and at first, uh, to be honest, I thought to myself, you know, this is typical philosophy. This is someone who has the luxury of sitting back and observing everybody else and coming up with this theoretical framework and its own language for how to describe things. And then is basically saying like, this is what's wrong with everybody. And if everybody would just become a deep thinking philosopher, everything would be fine. Those were sort of the walls that were going up. But the more that I read, the more Byung-Chul Han was able to carefully allow me to dismantle my own walls and to show me what I think is a, a very much a serious truth and then a way out. And so I feel like the Burnout Society is the framework, the setting up of Han's structure, his lens through which he's viewing our society and its malaise. But then Vita Contemplativa is sort of the path out. And there are actually a couple more books that I think are gonna expand on this even more. One is called The Scent of Time, and another one, Something About Beauty, which is giving us a new way or a new approach to aesthetics. Aesthetics, the capacity to observe and appreciate beauty without a utility being involved, without a means to an end. Slowly but surely, this just really got its hooks in me. And to be honest with you, it has really changed me. These are books that I now consider part of the handful of books that have totally shaped my worldview. 
And they're really, they're dangerous books in many ways, but I think in good ways. Just to give you a little bit of background in terms of the perspective from which I'm coming at these books. And admittedly, there is a stratum, a, a socioeconomic stratum of readers for whom this would be absolutely outlandish. As you think more on it, and as I read more deeply, we start to see that the very fact of the existence of such a stratum is because of how far we've gone into this achievement, performance-based burnout society. But over the years in my 25-year career in information technology, full-time, always in a corporate workspace environment, I have watched so many things that just repeat the same pattern over and over. And we find ourselves today in this brutally fast-paced, ultra-competitive world whereby really the only people who are getting things done or doing a good job or even a subpar job are those who are working 80 plus hours a week, running themselves into the ground. Our work-life balance is totally off. And it's even gotten to the point where I've seen shaming in the workplace for those who merely worked their 40 hours, who merely come in from eight to five. And there's increasingly an ultra obsession with optimization, more and more efficiency. How much more drops of sweat can we wring out of these humans? How much further can we push key performance indexes? And what Byung-Chul Han does so well in these books is to show the shift, the paradigm shift that has happened in society from a disciplinary, obedience-based society to a, an achievement and performance-based society. Of course, he's bringing in post-industrialization and capitalism and so on that are huge economic and social drivers that are exacerbating this performance-based society, this achievement-based society, the optimization and quantitatively obsessed society. And what's happening is we are beginning to lose an essential idleness and boredom and even a tiredness, as Byung-Chul Han refers to it, that characterize the vita contemplativa or the contemplative life, which is getting swallowed up by the vita activa, the active life the life of action. And hand in hand with that, he points out how we're seeing a spike in what he calls neuronal maladies, ADHD, ADD, burnout, depression, anxiety. We've moved beyond the industrial obedience-based society of Freud and Foucault. We've moved beyond the society known and critiqued by Jean Baudrillard and Hannah Arendt. And very strikingly, he puts together these dialectics of negativity and positivity. And the achievement society that we're in has replaced the negativity or the reinforcements of negativity for a reinforcement of positivity. But negativity in this context is referring to those Freudian-based models of the superego, repression and discipline, prohibition, duty, law, obedience. And positivity in this model is associated with affirmation and freedom and doing as one pleases, pleasure, inclination, basically letting people say and have the space to live out, don't tell me what not to do, tell me what I can do, which sounds great, the positive psychology movement. But with the excess of the positivity reinforcement model that we're living in, we see a shift from having an authoritative, absolute, external authority or an other, which is becoming dissolved into a sort of feedback loop of the self as ego. Or as Byung-Chul Han shows, 
what we've done is we've taken the Freudian model of the superego and the ego as the superego as the governor of the ego. And we now project the desires of the ego onto the superego. And we create what Byung Chua Han calls an ego ideal. Because of the absence of the model of negative reinforcement and the obedience society, we have lost the capacity and tools to deal with any kind of negative situation. Alterity, the other, is being replaced by not just a self, but an ideal self, a performance-enhanced, optimized ubermensch. And so as byung Chul Han points out, what this has led to is a society of self-production and self exploitation, meaning that the gears of capitalist society and economy shifting from this disciplinary hierarchy to the performance-based for them is great because now we are all sort of automatons that are in this loop of trying to outdo ourselves, that is, live up to our own ego ideal our ideal self. And when we can't measure up, we're crushed under the weight of it. We burn out. What we become are producers of ourselves that are constantly working to get positive reinforcement. Likes, praise, comments, shares, retweets, or whatever they're called now, re-Xs. With the Freudian model of the superego above the ego, it was a disciplinary model that would help suppress the ego or the id especially. But now even that model of negativity has been replaced with a positivity-based reinforcement mechanism between the ego ideal and the ego that's based on seduction. And so it seems appealing and the positivity reinforcement mechanisms that are in place stroke our ego just enough to keep us going. But of course, it's only intensifying and magnifying the need to outperform ourselves until finally we're crushed under the weight of burnout. So spurning external authority and the negative dialectics of discipline society, we have replaced the impetus for labor, the impetus for living with our own selves, causing now a loop of self-exploitation. Thus, a failure to perform or a failure to achieve now does not consist in an altercation with an other, but with the self. And thus, this self-referential feedback loop gives way to neuronal aberrations. And it's interesting how he leads into this. From a pathological standpoint, the incipient 21st century is determined neither by bacteria nor by viruses, but by neurons. And you have to kind of keep in mind, let's see, when was this written? This was written in First English Translation 2015, originally written in 2010. So keep in mind that this is about a decade before COVID. COVID for the 21st century can still be seen as an outlier or a standout thing in terms of what Byung Chul Han is getting at. But he's trying to say that we've sort of, as a species and in general, we've moved past the worries of bacteria and virus. And our new big overwhelming worries are neuronal. Neurological illnesses such as depression, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, borderline personality disorder, and burnout syndrome mark the landscape of pathology at the beginning of the 21st century. They are not infections, but infarctions. They do not follow from the negativity of what is immunologically foreign, but from an excess of positivity. And so when you, like I said, when you first read this, there's a lot of verbiage that makes you think, how can an excess of positivity be bad? And why is he setting us up with this pathological or immunological lens? He refers to the former obedience subjects of obedience 
society as now achievement subjects of the achievement society. And he says that they or we are entrepreneurs of ourselves. Disciplinary society is still governed by no. Its negativity produces madmen and criminals. In contrast, achievement society creates depressives and losers. It is not the excess of responsibility and initiative that makes one sick, but the imperative to achieve, the new commandment of late modern labor society. The complaint of the depressive individual, nothing is possible, can only occur in a society that thinks nothing is impossible. We owe the cultural achievements of humanity, which include philosophy, to deep contemplative attention. Culture presumes an environment in which deep attention is possible. Increasingly, such immersive reflection is being replaced by an entirely different form of attention, hyper-attention. A rash change of focus between different tasks, sources of information, and processes characterizes this scattered mode of awareness. Since it also has a low tolerance for boredom, it does not admit the profound idleness that benefits the creative process. Walter Benjamin calls this deep boredom a dream bird that hatches the egg of experience. If sleep represents the high point of bodily relaxation, deep boredom is the peak of mental relaxation. A purely hectic rush produces nothing new. It reproduces and accelerates what is already available. And again, when I first started reading this, I thought, okay, here's another philosopher who just believes that if everyone was an idle, loafing and loaming and looming and lingering thinker and philosopher, then all of our problems would be gone and we'd all be happy. But you might be right. But Han is not saying that we all just sit around and do nothing and live in this contemplative stasis. The Vita Contemplativa that he advocates is a lifestyle that is conducive to a creative process. And so it's not either or. It's not the Vita Activa or the Vita Contemplativa. I take this as the two working together such that the quality of the Vita Contemplativa enhances the Vita Activa. Our time in idleness and profound boredom, as he'll call it, in contemplation, renews us such that we can make better decisions, think more clearly about things, take better actions. As he shows over and over, the sort of runaway train of the society of optimization and achievement and excess completely bulldozes over thoughts about, for example, the best way to use nature to grow food. There's a very strong argument in these books that if more people had a capacity for Vita Contemplativa, then, for example, we would not have ruined our earth to the degree that we have. The Vita Contemplativa is necessary for a better Vita Activa. And when he talked about boredom and losing our capacity for boredom, I think about so many different things that I've read that have touched on this, this malaise, starting in, especially in the 20th century, where we suddenly cannot deal with boredom or idleness. We must always be doing something. Using Paul Cezanne as an example to highlight this, Byung-Chul Han says, it is only contemplative lingering that has access to phenomena that are long and slow. The reaction to a life that has become bare and radically fleeting occurs as hyperactivity, hysterical work, and production. It leads to a society of work in which the master himself has become a laboring slave. People who suffer from depression, bipolar disorder, or burnout syndrome develop symptoms such as lacking all vigor and becoming entirely apathetic. And so there are two different things here that really struck me. The reaction to a life that has become bare and radically fleeting 
occurs is hyperactivity, hysterical work in production. And the people that I've experienced firsthand in the workplace that really give into this, but they aren't predisposed to depression, bipolar disorder, anxiety, burnout syndrome. This is exactly what happens. This bare life, this radically fleeting life, and then the hysterical hyperactivity of work, they throw themselves into this cycle of achievement and constantly outdoing themselves and willingly becoming a modern slave to the workplace, or rather to themselves, really, but to a workplace that has fostered and magnified this society of self-exploitation. And these types of people, they get to the point where outside of work, they don't even know what to do with themselves. And everything is fragmented and fleeting. They might try to watch a show or try to watch a movie or do this or that, but work trumps everything. Work happens all through the weekend. Work days go from 5 a.m. to 9 p.m. Emails are coming from them around the clock. When they are somewhat forced to take an extended break, such as when the office closes for the holidays, they return to work talking about how they ended up just working on stuff anyway because they didn't know what to do with themselves. On the other hand, the people like Han is saying who suffer already or are predisposed to things like depression and so on, they suddenly become burned out. They lack vigor, enthusiasm's gone. They have a heaviness on them and they become just totally jaded and or apathetic. He says that reacting immediately, yielding to every impulse already amounts to illness and represents a symptom of exhaustion. And he just nails it here because again, with the metrics obsessed, performance obsessed, optimization obsessed culture, the view is inevitably on quantity over quality. And time to think, time to research, time to train is almost always completely steamrolled by action, action, action. And so what happens is the laborer, the achievement individual, doesn't have time to think, or they have to think on their feet, or think in flight, make snap decisions. And so we all get conditioned to reacting immediately and yielding to every impulse. We're losing the capacity to be presented with something and then take time for contemplation. From my experience, you can argue with directors and executives, stakeholders, project managers, until you fall over and croak about the need to think through things up front. And you will almost always get overridden in favor of delivering sooner. Today we live in a world that is very poor in interruption. Betweens and between times are lacking. Acceleration is abolishing all intervals. And at first I thought, what do you mean very poor in interruption? We're interrupted constantly. But what he means is sort of the other side of the coin, meaning interrupting the life of constant interruption for these times of idleness and stillness. And of course, those who jump headlong into this performance-based achievement society figure out their own ways of temporary solutions. As a society of activeness, achievement society is slowly developing into a doping society. In the meanwhile, the negative expression brain doping has been replaced by neuro enhancement. Nor is the general use of neuroenhancers viewed as a problem. One need only ensure fairness, namely by putting them at the disposal of all. If doping were permitted in sports, it would degrade into a pharmaceutical race. And I know many, many people who microdose different things to enhance thinking and enhance memory, and basically so they can optimize themselves and achieve even more. The society of achievement and activeness is generating excessive tiredness and exhaustion. These psychic conditions characterize a world that is poor in negativity and in turn dominated by excess positivity. They are not immunological reactions presupposing the negativity of the immunologically other. 
Rather, they are caused by a too much of positivity. The excessiveness of performance enhancement leads to psychic infarctions. The tiredness of exhaustion is the tiredness of positive potency. It makes one incapable of doing something. Tiredness that inspires is tiredness of negative potency. Tiredness that inspires, namely of not to. The Sabbath, too, a word that originally meant stopping, is a day of not to. And it's really striking this analogy to the Sabbath where you rest. This tiredness and this exhaustion and this resting is at the end of one's labor so that more creative acts can take place. It's a, a more of an abidance. In virtual spaces, the ego can practically move independent of the reality principle, which would provide a principle of alterity and resistance. In all the imaginary spaces of virtuality, the narcissistic ego encounters itself first and foremost. Increasingly, virtualization and digitalization are making the real disappear, which makes itself known above all through its resistance. In other words, living ourselves out and interacting in digital spaces in the virtual realm and with its hyper-personalized algorithms and its personalization settings and so on is effectively exacerbating this model of positive reinforcement such that we can easily live out our virtual lives without any resistance from an other. Now, I know plenty of that is out there. I hear about people on Facebook getting into political mudslinging in the comments and so on. So that's not exactly what I'm talking about. But for the most part, you can go online and not have to deal with anything you don't want to deal with. One only has to walk away or block somebody. In social networks, the function of friends is primarily to heighten narcissism by granting attention as consumers to the ego exhibited as a commodity. Okay, so in the burnout society, Byung Chul Han certainly presents a, a compelling argument and way of looking at a lot of very real malaise that we deal with today. And there's definitely been a paradigm shift. And it's interesting to get a view of older colleagues of mine who came up through the disciplinary society versus the younger interns and fresh out of college who came out of this achievement society. And what I see and hear is that the the older ones, you know, are looking at the younger ones and they're hearing all this rhetoric from the achievement society, the younger ones about needing to take mental health days, which seem to occur every Monday and Friday. You know, they're seen as lazy, but they talk about protecting their mental health or keeping themselves psych psychologically safe by not working too many hours in a row versus, of course, the older ones who are just workhorses with no real social life. And I'm giving, of course, the extremes of both ends. But all that to say that it's just a very real phenomenon that we're seeing. And it's amazing to see the older ones sort of scoff at the very idea of wanting to take care of oneself or, or taking measures to make sure one isn't being exploited by the workplace. And we could go down all sorts of rabbit holes to unravel that. I decided to follow up the Burnout Society though with Vita Contemplativa because I saw this as taking us more towards the path of how do we get out of this? And one major argument that he makes clear is that inactivity, downtime, true downtime, is what elevates us above mere living, which is simply survival. Honestly, th this book is, everything about these two books is utterly countercultural. If everybody started to really heed the thoughts and points in these books, it would cause a global economic disaster in such a way to where eventually it may not be such a bad thing. I mean, as I've been reading through these books and thinking on them, I just can't help but hear the litany 
of opposition. And some of it is stuff that I agree with and stuff that, you know, we should start posing back against these books. But others, I think, are totally invalid and indicative of just how far we've gone into the conditioning that Byung Chul Han points out. Another thing he does in here is he motions for a recovery of parts of Romanticism that were crowded out by the Enlightenment and now are certainly eclipsed by our post-industrialist performance society. He takes a lot from Walter Benjamin, Nietzsche, Heidegger especially. I believe that Heidegger is a major part of Byung Chul Han's thought. I believe he did his uh, dissertation on Heidegger. He goes against a lot of Hannah Arendt. Hannah Arendt uh, is very much action-based in a way that sort of puts into contrast what Byung Chul Han is motioning for. And also with Heidegger, he is very much bringing in Heidegger after what's called the turn in Heidegger that happened shortly after his opus, Being and Time. Uh, there's also notable things towards the end from Schleiermacher, Novalis, and Holderlin. We are losing a sense for the kind of inactivity that is not an incapability, not a refusal, not just the absence of activity, but a capacity in itself. So we're starting to, he's starting to sharpen what he means by the Vita Contemplativa. And I will say that a lot of the opposition that rose up in me from the burnout, in reaction to the burnout society, began to be answered by Vita Contemplativa. Such as, of course, me, I have to put food on the table and I've got a certain lifestyle set up, which, you know, Thoreau, I can hear Henry David Thoreau telling me, well, your lifestyle is the problem. <laughs> but, you know, I've got a, a wife and a daughter and we have a certain way of living and I, I have standards of the life that I want to give them. And so I can't just quit my job and start planting beans out in my backyard. And so I, you know, I have this voice that says, look, man, not all of us can just be philosophers, but I digress. Under capitalist relations of production, inactivity returns in the form of an encapsulated outside. We call it leisure time because it serves the purpose of respite from work. It remains tied to the logic of work. As derivative of work, it represents a functional element of production. And so I love that he wrote that because he's showing a difference between what we call, or what I just a moment ago called downtime or leisure time that purports to be this time away from work, but is really subsumed by the work life and made a derivative of it. So, you know, I wrote this out because I was thinking that even my leisure time that is supposed to be a break from work and performance, which I have chosen to use primarily for reading, which should be great, right? Reading books should be the Vita Contemplativa. It's not. It has slowly turned into another means of performance and production. And Wow, you know, and then I read, we have forgotten that it is precisely inactivity which does not produce anything. If we lose the ability to be inactive, we begin to resemble machines that must simply function. And this hit really hard, especially when I realized that I have slowly but surely brought this achievement-based optimization obsession into my leisure time. And it has crowded out my Vita Contemplativa. And I have thought that it's okay because it's reading and sharing reading with others, right? But what has slowly happened is that I'm constantly trying to optimize more reading time, more books, and then outdo myself with videos. But how much am I really getting out of all of my reading and... How much am I really giving you out of all these videos when I'm effectively starving myself of the Vita Contemplativa? How much better could my reading and these videos be if I leaned in to this life, this capacity, 
that Byung Chul Han is advocating. He says early on that social media accelerates the disintegration of community. And I just jotted, how can that be when I see that it's bringing so many people together? And he answers that in a few different ways as he moves on. For example, only silence enables us to say something unheard of. The compulsion of communication, by contrast, leads to the reproduction of the same, to conformism. And he goes in and supports this claim. And the more that he did, the more I was just blown away. And this really, really struck me when we're crowded out by constant connectivity, constant communication, constant interaction. There's this false sense of community that leads to a total or, or a constant regurgitation of sameness and conformism. And so something unheard of, something unique and new and original and revitalizing can only be found in its opposite, in being disconnected, in silence. And again, not either or, not total one way or the other. And he says, being connected is not the same as being together. In fact, unlimited connectivity weakens our ties. A deep relationship requires an other who can make themselves unavailable. He draws this great analogy with fasting. He says that ritual fasting renews life by enlivening the senses. And indeed, uh, I do a lot of intermittent fasting. And sometimes when I push it just a little bit farther, it's, it's almost like it doesn't matter what I eat. The food is just brilliant and dazzling to my palate. It sharpens the senses and brings that renewed vitality and radiance to the food and to the act of eating. And so if we look at inactivity as a form of spiritual fasting, it therefore has a healing effect. The compulsion of production transforms inactivity into a form of activity in order to exploit it. Thus, for example, even sleep is these days regarded as an activity. The so-called power nap is an activity of sleep. And if we extend this compulsion of performance and optimization in the area of sleep, it's possible that in the future, humans will abolish both sleep and dreams on the grounds of inefficiency. And that's exactly what S.D. Krastovska took on in her short, beautiful novel, The Eyelid. Sleep is the highest point of physical relaxation, whereas boredom is the highest point of mental relaxation. So whereas many different people have pointed to boredom as a sort of cultural malaise, as I said earlier, it's really the inability to be or to cope with being bored that's the real problem. Inactivity is time consuming. It requires a long whiling, an intense contemplative lingering which brought to mind the early lines of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. I loaf and invite my soul. I lean and loaf at my ease, observing a spear of summer grass. To an external view, it appears inactive, but this inactivity is the condition of the possibility of experience. Inactivity is not the opposite of activity. Rather, activity feeds off inactivity. The dialectic of inactivity transforms inactivity into a threshold, a zone of indeterminacy that enables us to create something that was not there before. Without this threshold, the same keeps repeating itself. The loss of the faculty of contemplation affects our relation to language. Dazed by the rush of information and communication, we move away from poetry as the contemplation of language and begin even to hate it. When language is nothing but work and the production of information, it loses its radiance. It becomes worn out and keeps producing the same. Wow. It's amazing that he pointed out and cited poetry specifically as a contemplation of language and how with the loss of the capacity for a contemplative life, it makes total sense why now poetry in terms of popularity is so low. 
under so many other things because those other things are mere information for the most part. What is catastrophic is not the eruption of an unexpected event, but the continuity of the on and on, the continual repetition of the same. Boredom is catastrophic to us. Unlike action, which pushes forward, reflection leads us back to where we always already are. It opens us up for a being there, Dasein, that precedes all doing, all action. It even lingers ahead of action. When everything is readily available and consumable, contemplative attention is impossible. And I think that's because since there's always something there, you know, go back 300 years, there's no streaming, there's no text messaging. When something is so readily available and so easily consumable, we get addicted to it. Contemplation, idleness, boredom is not easy for us. Play and dance are entirely free of the in order to. Even ornaments do not serve the purpose of adorning something. Things liberated from the in order to become festive. They do not function, but shine and radiate. They emanate a contemplative calmness that enables a lingering. And I just thought that really echoed William H. Gass's arguments on art in his debate with John Gardner that we looked at at the end of my Against the Day video. And really, we're, we're getting more and more towards the area of aesthetics here. Whoever is awestruck delivers himself to the other of the self. In awe, a special kind of attention arises, a friendly receptivity for the other. Awe teaches us to listen. Being in awe of something, learning to be in awe of something, is a major tenet of the area of aesthetics. And I just thought to myself, when was the last time I really experienced true awe? Instead of just a rapid succession of moments where I was struck by something and stilled by something, but not truly in awe. We are very well informed, yet in the absence of narrative, we are without orientation. If human happiness, as Nietzsche says, depends on there being an incontrovertible truth, we are indeed without happiness. And so in the last part of this book, Byung Chul Han is getting ready to show us a type and a means of attaining the Vita Contemplativa that is explicitly modeled on religion, on spirituality. But for those who aren't religious, who don't have a spiritual bent, there's still hope in Byung Chul Han's system. And I believe he's Catholic, by the way. But he says the Sabbath is a palace in time that releases the human being from the transient world into the world to come. And he takes this from Joshua Heschel, who refers to it as a temple in time. The deep sense of the Sabbath is the suspension of history in blissful inactivity. The creation of man is not the last act of Genesis. It is only with the Sabbath that creation is truly complete. He quotes Nietzsche with this, In every age, the good men are those who bury the old thoughts deeply and make them bear fruit. The farmers of the spirit. I love that. Industrialization brought about the beginning of the disciplinary regime. Domination itself took on the form of a machine. Disciplinary power inserts the human being into the gear train of the panoptical machine. Digitalization produces the information regime whose psychopolitics surveils and controls our actions with algorithms and artificial intelligence. If it does not incorporate the Vita Contemplativa, the Vita Activa degenerates into hyperactivity and culminates in the burnout not only of the psyche, but of the whole planet. I mean, leading up to this, different things he was saying, I started thinking to myself, well, this sounds a lot like what I've heard called centering prayer or entering into the cloud of the unknowing. Basically, a contemplation of the immensity and unknowability of God. 
Listen to how he sets this up. Today's crisis of religion cannot be explained simply with reference to the fact that we have lost all faith in God or become suspicious of certain religious doctrines. The crisis suggests that, at a deeper level, we are gradually losing the faculty of contemplation. Religion requires a particular form of attention. It is the soul's hyperactivity that accounts for the demise of religious experience. The crisis of religion is a crisis of attention. That's interesting. According to Schleiermacher, a theologian, religion dissolves all activities into an amazed contemplation of the infinite. Atheism does not rule out religion. For Schleiermacher, it is possible to conceive of religion without God. What is essential to religion is not God, but a desire for the infinite, which finds its fulfillment in the intuition of the universe. Selflessness is also essential to religious experience. So in an age of narcissistic self-production and self-exhibition, religion loses its foundation. Self-production is more damaging to religion than is atheism. Those who hand death to themselves participate in the infinite. So it's very much about entering into a space where your self, your very ego, is dissolved. And if you can cultivate a life where you spend time consistently and often allowing your self to dissolve, you will begin to experience and discern realms, or let's not call them realms, but a life that's teeming beyond the borders of ourselves. A big, big thanks again to Australian artist and psychiatrist Kieran Forster for foisting these books on me. They have really awakened me to my own shortcomings, to something that I do feel myself starved for. And it has challenged me to decide what changes I need to make to make sure that I have room for the Vita Contemplativa. Thank you all so much for watching, for listening, and I really hope you'll check out the ideas of Byung-Chul Han and let me know what you think.